Good evening. Welcome to uh, Newark's daily COVID-19 update. We do these every evening from Monday through Friday at 5 p.m. on our Facebook Live. Thank you uh, for listening. And we are hoping that you'll become an ambassador and make sure this information gets out, out to the folks that you know. We are doing these uh, kind of joint meetings every Friday now. Uh, today, uh, we have with us, uh, of course, Dr. Wade uh, from our health department here in the city of Newark. Uh, the Chancellor of Rutgers Biomedical uh, and Health Sciences uh, Institute, Dr. Strom, uh, uh, Executive Director and Health Officer, uh, Carrie uh, Naraki, hope I said it right, Naraki, Carrie Naraki, and the Superintendent of Newark Public Schools, Roger Leon, uh, is with us today. Uh, they will join me in giving you a collective update on what's happening in and around our city in response to COVID-19, uh, some maybe answering some of the questions that many of you may have, uh, as well as giving you uh, information about uh, what you should be doing or need to be doing uh, going forward. Uh, I would like to start with Dr. Wade. You wanna give us an update, the numbers, a few things uh, that you wanna share with us this evening. Surely. Uh, at this point, which is uh, midday for Good Friday the 10th, Newark has, uh, 2,341 positive cases for, uh, for COVID-19. Yesterday we had 2,163, so it's a 180-person increase. But uh, over the past week, we've been averaging about 200 persons increase per day, where the week before we were averaging about 100 uh, positive cases uh, per day. And I, uh, we got our first case on uh, March 12th, right. April 10th. So on March 12th, we had one case. Four weeks later, we have over 2,300. Just to put in perspective, the increase in cases in Newark. Uh, today, so far, we have 106 persons who have perished due to COVID-19. Yesterday, we had 99, seven person increase. Uh, in our county, uh, as of uh, about 11 o'clock this morning, we had 6,580 cases. Yesterday, it was 6,069. So again, we, and we have been over the, over the past week averaging about 500 cases increase countywide. Today, uh, at this point, deaths are 352. There were 312 yesterday. So it's an increase of 40 deaths in our county. Uh, and lastly, I'll share for our state at this point in time, 54,588 cases. Yesterday it was 51,027. So uh, we've increased about 3,500. That's been our, been our per day. That's been our, our pace um, for this week. And in terms of deaths, we now have 1,132 for the state, where yesterday it was 1,700. So another increase of 232 deaths for our state. I uh, want to keep in mind that the numbers that I just read, by the numbers will be different. The numbers are increasing, uh, and as we get them, we share them. So we, again, want to make sure that you, you take these numbers and the recommendations that our mayor set forth for the city extremely seriously, uh, because the cure is not uh, in a tablet or a pill or even a respirator, uh, that's for those who are extremely ill. But in terms of prevention, it's you and I. It's following the directions of social uh, distancing, staying inside unless it's absolutely necessary. Uh, because without that, we are essentially playing community Russian roulette. You know, where you put the one bullet in the gun and, and turn, turn the nozzles and, and pull it and, and hope that the, gun, the bullet doesn't come out. That's what we're doing if we don't follow direction. Uh, and the result is numbers that we see. So we need everyone's cooperation. It's the, it's the best protection and therefore the best cure for our society. Thank you, Dr. Wade. Uh, Dr. Strom, you wanna jump in here and give us an update of what's happening over there at Rutgers Biomedical? Sure, my, my pleasure. <clears throat> um, I, I should, by the way, just give it uh, as a background, my biases, I'm a physician. 
I, I'm also an epidemiologist and I've been involved in preparedness uh, things as well. So, so this re has resonated very well with me. And sorry, I'm obviously home like everybody else should be. And my, my, my uh, home phone ringing. Um, I, I also wanted, in addition to, obviously I'll come and answer the mayor's question, but I wanted to congratulate the mayor. I, I think what you're doing is exactly the right thing. I think that what, what we need is for the public to be following the mayor's advice, uh, exactly as Dr. Wade just ta talked about. Um, the, it, the, the way to get at this thing to beat it is to follow the advice that the, that the mayor has been giving. So let me talk specifically about Rutgers. Um, uh, it has been apparent to us since early January when the epidemic became obvious that, that this was going to become a, a pandemic. And so in my role as executive vice president for the university, over the course of, of January and February, we started planning. And in late February um, at Rutgers, we launched our, our emergency operations center, which has been meeting uh, initially every week and now it's every day uh, uh, to keep up and to coordinate uh, across the university the things that, I, that have to be done. But pro probably the most important thing we do is provide medical care. We, we have a thousand physicians uh, half, obviously, in, in Newark. Uh, we have 800 residents and fellows. They're the people in the front line. They are the staff, staffing University Hospital. Um, and, and everything that's happening at University Hospital, and from a physician point of view, are our docs. Um, they're, they're the front line. They're the ones putting their lives at risk. They're, they're the ones getting sick, as a number of them have, uh, in, in providing the care. And our, our first, second, and third priority has been, been to support that, to support them, uh, accordingly. Um, as part of that, we graduated our medical students early, the New Jersey med, uh, medical school uh, medical students, so they could go out and join the manpower. We've graduated our pharmacy students early, we've graduated our nursing students early, because the rate limiting step ultimately in this epidemic is going to be healthcare providers, as more and more of the uh, providers get sick. And the, the, the city needs more of them to be able to, to provide help. Uh, we've developed new tests for it. There's a, a rapid testing test that was developed um, at New Jersey Medical School um, that can give you answers, not, not in a week, which is what the commercial uh, testers are doing, but in 45 minutes, um, and, and turn around and be able to give. Obviously, a huge issue um, for this epidemic has been insufficient testing. Um, rapid testing is extremely useful, very useful, particularly to University Hospital, because someone shows up in the emergency room they don't have to wait for a week to know if they have the disease. Right in the emergency room, they can get the answers uh, about whether, whether or not they have the disease. And again, this has been done uh, at New Jersey Medical School uh, accordingly. Uh, we've also developed a capacity to do 10,000 tests a day in one of our labs. And, and um, the UH University Hospital is using that to be able to get tests and to be able to get test results uh, for the patients. Other things we have been mobilizing, um, uh, everybody's probably heard about PPEs, personal protective equipment, to help protect healthcare providers, um, uh, minimize the chances of them getting sick. Uh, we've not only mobilized that from all our research labs, um, but we're actually manufacturing them uh, uh, um, in taking advantage of our engineering uh, facilities to be able to manufacture more of them. We've also contacted a number of, of, of um, uh, industries um, and, and Tesla being one of them to be able to manufacture for us ventilators. Um, and the, it turns out the Tesla ventilators were missing a key part to attach to the, uh, um, to, to the equipment in the hospital. And we manufactured in our laboratories that key piece to be, to be able to make it happen. We've established, again, based in Newark, of course, uh, a, a COVID center to be able to do research on, on the disease. We have studies underway of treatments, whether or not, uh, what things may work as treatments, as well as who, who turns positive uh, um, if, if they're a healthcare worker, who, who becomes positive. Our um, uh, state call center, poison control center, again, obviously based in Newark, uh, serves as the state call center for, for COVID and, and gets hundreds of calls a day from all over the state asking people for advice. Our dental school, has pulled its dental chairs out so that its space, and, uh, because it has oxygen and other things, can be used as expansion space by University Hospital to be able to expand patients uh, and handle the, the increased volume. 
uh, UH has had every day increasing number of patients. As of today, there's 218 um, uh, patients with COVID at University Hospital. Other patients are there too, um, and, and it's burst, bursting at the seams. Uh, we've also provided parking lot space realistically for freezers um, to use to, to handle uh, morgue overflows um, um, at, at University Hospital. We provide housing in our dorms for healthcare workers because they're now, uh, for understandable reasons, afraid to go home because they don't want to contaminate their families. Um, and, and so they'll be, be uh, in the, the, the Rutgers dormitories. Our behavioral health center, UB, UBHC, University Behavioral Health Center, helps with workforce and community stress to, uh, uh, across the, the, the state and obviously uh, centered in Newark as well. And finally, we've, we've refurbished a laboratory facility um, uh, in the medical science building in Newark to use for, to decontaminate N95 masks. People have heard about masks, shortages of masks. Um, we don't have enough of them. Uh, we're trying to manufacture them as well. We can't buy enough. We, we're using one of those laboratory facilities to try to take other masks and try to, to, to decontaminate them for people. Lots and lots of other things. I don't want to take, take more time, but, but you know, we, we're, we're full speed um, really trying to support the city uh, um, and the country in, in, in this, this time of, of what amounts to a plague. So Let me end though, as I began, just because I want to make, make the point, it's so important. What Dr. Wade said, what the mayor said, critically important, what citizens can mostly do is follow the mayor's advice and, and stay, stay indoors, stay socially isolated. There's no definitive treatment for the disease. There is a way we can stop its spread, which, which is by staying indoors. So I just, a, a follow up on, on, on that, uh, Dr. Strom, you, you, you're not suggesting that people just walk to UH to get a test, right? I, absolutely, you are absolutely correct. I am not suggesting that. <laughs> right, right, right. That there's protocols and process that it should follow to get a test. Just want to make sure. I know that we need some of those nurses, uh, so uh, I'm gonna make sure Dr. Wade uh, talks to you about about getting a hold of some of those nurses Absolutely. and figuring out how we can help out around the testing stuff too. Just uh, uh, at this time, want to bring uh, Carrie Naraki in uh, and give her an opportunity to uh, discuss some of the things that they're doing and give us an update as well. Great, thank you. Um, so within the county, all the public health agencies are working together and communicating regularly. Um, that includes all the municipal health departments, the county health department, and the Essex Regional Health Commission. We have regularly scheduled conference calls where we exchange information and give updates on state and federal guidance. Um, Essex Regional Health Commission is working alongside the county health department at the Essex County Emergency Operations Center. We're collecting the data on cases with the municipal health departments and we assist the local health departments with contact tracing of the cases. We also have a medical reserve corps of medical and civilian volunteers who assist in the contact tracing as well. Through contact tracing, we're identifying and assessing people who may have been exposed to a positive case, and then we determine those that need to be quarantined or isolated to the best extent possible. Oh, well, thank you. Sure. Um, just want to reach out now to allow the superintendent, Roger Leon, to give us an update. They're doing some great things at Newark Public Schools. Your opportunity to talk about some of that stuff, please. Uh, yes, good evening, Mayor. Well, we were doing uh, some prep work prior to the closing of schools, and we believe now that the thinking then has proven to be very beneficial uh, to us. As it relates to um, health and safety, first I want to talk about the work with the facilities. Um, the facilities team actually began intensive training and cleaning. The cleaning actually began throughout all of our schools and the training magnified into a um, specialized team of custodial staff members where we have actually purchased some uh, new uh, equipment that we uh, have been using during these uh, past couple of weeks in cleaning up all of our facilities. Not only are they doing that now, but when in fact school returns, uh, this will be a new cleaning regimen that we will be doing in all of our schools and all of our facilities um, moving forward. Health and safety. In this area, um, the principals and nurses actually received uh, training on preventative measures in early March. Uh, the nurses in turn uh, began to do some training of our students and staff 
in all of the preventative measures that we know CDC has in fact um, uh, directed us. And we continuously remind students and staff to revert back to the CDC guidelines as we know that those guidelines um, change uh, sometimes on a daily basis. So the idea there was to prepare our students and staff for an unfortunate reality where they are not in school at this time. The third area is instruction. Um, we have actually designed learning at home plans that began on the 16th of March and will continue for all of our students for all of the days until in fact we return back to school and that classes resume uh, there. One of the interesting things that we uh, began to do during the last two weeks is to teach some very important and intense health lessons for two purposes. First, to remind some of the students things that we were sharing with them when they were in school, and then also to have them help inform their parents and people that are in their household of important health practices that we want everyone, in fact, to follow. The fourth area of the six that I wanted to talk to everyone about deals with our food program. One of the things that we did was open up 16 food service program sites throughout the entire city of Newark. These are elementary and high schools that you might not actually attend, but might in fact be the school that's closest to where you are right now. Regardless of school, regardless of grade, I want you to know that these 15 food service program sites are open Monday to Friday from 9.30 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. And any student would like to have breakfast or lunch and lunch can also um, visit us at these uh, locations. Two important um, and I think really, really fun things that we are doing uh, considering the realities that everyone is living today uh, the first one is I want to uh, give all of our students in Newark uh, this announcement. Anything that I've shared will always be found on the district's website. But we have launched the COVID-19 Health and Safety Public Service Announcement with Slogan Contest. This is a contest that the deadline actually is on the 20th of April. We're inviting students. We need student voices at a time where every day appears to be darker than the previous, we need our students to shed light for everyone to see. We need these public service announcements to show how great our students are, to help uplift those who may actually be, be sick and to forewarn those who are not taking things as serious as we need them, that we need every single citizen in the city of Newark to not only follow preventative measures, but listen to the executive orders of our mayor and to in fact be safe. We want the students, actually, we need the student voices to ring loudly in every single one of our homes throughout this great city. And the last thing is that um, the week of April 20th is when in fact classes resume. Next week is spring break. I want everyone to stay safe and to remember everything that we've been teaching you. But the week of April 20th in the city of Newark, we're calling it Spirit Week. Every day, there will be a different activity that we want the students to engage in. So April 20th to April 24th is, spring, uh, is Spirit Week in the city of Newark. We want everyone to log on to the district's website to see what activities we have planned for you on each of the days upon our return from spring break. Stay safe, everybody. Thank you, Superintendent. Uh, I, have a, I want to get right into these questions. I have a couple of questions that you can help me field. The first one is about masks uh, and gloves. I know that uh, the governor has pushed his mandate for everybody to wear masks. We did it in Newark probably a couple of days before that. Everybody has to wear a mask. Uh, there are stores that are not allowing people in unless they have masks. The uh, workers are wearing masks in these stores. They have to be. Uh, we have questions from folks that are asking, is this something that we should be doing and why? Do we think this is like working or why? I think people have the idea that the mask that they're wearing uh, is really to protect them and they don't understand that 
uh, we're telling people to wear masks so we can protect us from you. Anybody can jump in on that. Doc, you want to start us off? Uh, yeah, I'll start us off. Uh, wearing a mask is one of the most effective things we can do in, in preventing further spread throughout our community. Why so? Well, you've heard a lot about N95 masks, and that's for healthcare workers and first responders who are closely engaged with a person who is positive or most likely to be positive. And that mask, uh, which is the most effective, is to protect the wearer, the clinician, if you will, or the police officer or the fireman from the person that they are trying to save. But the, the mask uh, directive that the mayor has given for all of us, all of us, is a mask that is not as, uh, as it's not to protect you. It's to keep uh, your cough, your sneeze, sneeze, and even your breath, which can potentially have the virus in it, from moving from you to the person next to you or across from you. So it's the best way we can minimize the spread. So when you wear it, you are showing love to the people next to you and around you and that you consider dear. If you don't wear it, you are saying, I don't care. Okay. Again, when I'm Russian roulette, okay, you can't assume that you're not infected because you feel fine. Upwards of 80% of people who are carrying the virus feel fine. But it is those individuals who are spreading the disease because when, you're, when you feel sick, you isolate yourself anyway. You stay home. You get in your bed. You, you, you wrap yourself up. But it's, it's feeling well, and the potential for spread is the reason for which we're asking all Newarkers, and as a matter of fact, across the country should be doing the same. And thank the mayor for showing leadership in this area. Cover your face. What type of mask? It doesn't matter. Okay? It, it can be a, a handkerchief. It, it can be a scarf. This is a time to be creative. Okay, let, let, let's show our creativity. We're creative people, right? Let, let's have contests amongst one another and let's have, create a little business for yourself, okay? Develop masks. You don't need the masks that are required for the, the medical providers to use because those masks are in short supply and we need them in our hospitals and our clinics and doctor's office. But community-wise, we can be, and not only wear the mask, but encourage your neighbor to do so. Do so. It literally can save a life. Anybody else, Dr. Strom, uh, Carrie, you want to jump in on that? Yeah, I, I'll just emphasize a couple of the points that, that, that the mayor and Dr. Wade made so well. Um, the purpose of these masks isn't to protect the, the individual. The purpose is to protect everybody around you. And the fact that you're feeling well isn't an excuse not to wear them. It's not it, it, because the goal isn't um, uh, because most of this disease is being passed by people who are feeling well. And so you need to wear a mask. But it does. It should not be an N95 or surgical mask because those need to be saved for our healthcare workers. It could be anything. It could be a handkerchief. It could be a, a kerchief. Exactly as Dr. Wade was talking about, something to cover your ma mouth and nose um, is, is, is important. Some people say, I'll, "I'll wear a mask and they'll just cover their face," or "I'll wear a mask and just the nose." Even just breathing spreads these germs, um, and you don't know if you you have the disease. So the goal is to protect spreading uh, uh, across the city. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, and just one more thing to add, what we're trying to do is protect the vulnerable populations. We don't know the people around us that may have underlying conditions. Um, you know, we want to protect the elderly. So by, by doing that, you're protecting the people that may be weaker than you. That's an excellent point uh, because it changes the whole concept of wearing a mask, this whole individuality I'm, I'm, I'm caring about, I'm thinking about myself as opposed to now I'm thinking about everybody else, this collective, this community piece of it. I'm wearing a mask because I'm trying to save other people's lives. And I think that's the point we should push. Uh, 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 somebody's asking, where can they get it? Listen, they just told you you can make your own mask. But on top of that, the city of Newark Police Department and Fire Department are going to be passing out uh, uh, masks that they've uh, gotten, makeshift masks. We'll be passing them out in the community starting today. Uh, we, we, we are going to, the city is going to continue to do that. So there's no excuse for folks who say they don't have one. Um, this question is to the superintendent. It says, if I only have a hard copy work packet for my child, will they be marked absent from school if they don't 
uh, have a laptop to sign in? Absolutely not. The learning at home plans are designed for every day of the week. Uh, so we expect any student that has the packet to make sure that you're completing every single one of the assignments. And upon everyone's return to school, that is in fact what is uh, being graded unless it's actually received by your teacher prior to that time. So um, every single student, whether you are um, completing your learning at home uh, plans packet or actually completing classes online, uh, your attendance is gonna be recorded by the completion of all of the work that we've given to you. I have another one for you who says, it, it, what's going on with the Wi-Fi? Will they extend the Wi-Fi uh, for us as well? Yes, so any student who actually has, on, uh, has a computer at home but needs online access, uh, no one should be paying for it. They, in fact, uh, would be getting it uh, from us and, and Altice uh, for free. Uh, you can get more information by um, communicating directly with your uh, teacher or inquiring with your principal. And if you ever have a question uh, like that one and you're not able to get any answer, you could always call me at 973-733-7333. 973-733-7333. And we'll be able to answer questions just like that for you. Right. And uh, breakfast and lunch, is it going to be served during the spring break? Yes, so uh, we're excited to announce that. Thanks for the question. I'm glad um, it was asked, Mayor. Uh, everyone knows that during spring break, um, obviously schools are not in session. Uh, while our school buildings are, are not in session, obviously classes are. Um, however, spring break, everyone is off. The only thing that um, will be uh, actually happening at our 16 sites is our food service program. So that's Monday to Friday, all of next uh, week during spring break between the hours of 9.30 and 11.30 a.m. And Mayor, I wanted to remind everyone that the list is on the district's website. But if you're in the North, First Avenue, Hernandez, McKinley, and Park. If you're in the South Ward, Belmont, Runyon, Carver, Weekwake. If you're in the East Ward, Eastside, Hawkins, South Street. If you're in the West Ward, Mount Vernon, Speedway, and 13th Avenue. And finally, if you're in the Central Ward, Central High School, Flag and Quitman. Those are the 16 sites, and they will all be uh, open during spring break for breakfast and lunch. Thank you. Um, Dr. Way is a homeless guy I see sleeping outside every day. Is there a task force to pick these folks up or deal with the homeless population? Uh, that cannot make it to a shelter on their own? And what is the overall plan? Uh, I was gonna jump on that, but since you're here, you might as well handle it. Okay. Well, firstly, yes, yes, the city does have, uh, through the Department of Health, uh, has contracted with uh, Bridges, uh, which is uh, an organization that, that uh, has done a tremendous job historically and now is under contract with us uh, to provide outreach and engagement for our residents without addresses. Uh, and I, I don't want to go further without uh, uh, thanking and, and giving a shout out to all of our um, all of our homeless uh, community service groups, individuals, and organizations that have been doing this work for decades, uh, often go unnoticed or unapplauded, and they are major contributors in our efforts to help individuals who are on the street to get into sheltering. But specifically, uh, we have this uh, this team of led by Bridges and supported by the, the aforementioned groups, they go out uh, from uh, nine in the morning uh, until 11 at night. Uh, we have bands, they go out, they literally outreach and engage. They connect, they talk, they try to convince these individuals to come into sheltering. And we do have room in our, in our shelters for them to come. Uh, and and uh, though many of those that you see on the street for various reasons from just having had years of bad experience with shelters um, or uh, have substance abuse uh, or mental health issues, you know, have heretofore chosen not to go, uh, we are aggressively, uh, compassionately, but aggressively trying to encourage them and bring them in. Uh, something I do want to share with you, and we will give more details early next week, is that the city has, uh, has been in the process and is committing to um, establish uh, uh, a couple of facilities 
uh, that will be um, focused for our uh, residents without addresses. One, to, to uh, expand our sheltering capacity uh, in an environment that's, that's a lot more attractive and engaging uh, and hoping that that will help to, to get them to commit to leave the streets. Um, and then secondly, uh, we're going to be uh, uh, establishing a, a location to uh, engage our residents without addresses who are COVID positive so that, uh, so that we can bring them into a location where they can await uh, the CDC recommended course of time for them to be able to, to go back uh, and not to the street, but as once we engage them, now we can get them to our expanded uh, sheltering location. Uh, and it, it ties into as well that uh, we're very focused on our hospitals uh, that have uh, uh, individuals that are positive, don't need to be hospitalized, but they don't have a home to go to. So these efforts are, enabled, are to enable the hospitals to, if you will, uh, trans transition those individuals into a safe space where they're, they, they, can, they can convalesce, they can rest, and if there are any minor issues, we can address those, but it'll open up bed space so that the truly sick and those needing hospitalizations uh, can receive it. So it's a very comprehensive plan, though I've said it in short fashion, uh, but we, I do want you, the, uh, our homeless service uh, community to know that uh, you'll be getting a phone call from me Monday and Tuesday so that I can personally engage with you, um, give, you give you more details on what we're doing, get input from you so that um, you will absolutely be part of what we're doing to address the needs of this portion of our community. Uh, Ms. Naraki, uh, Dr. Strom, is it safe for people to reuse their gloves and masks? Um, it's my understanding that the the, well, the cloth mask definitely can be reused. They can usually generally be washed as well. But in terms of the gloves, that they shouldn't not be reused. Right. It, yeah, it really depends on, you know, that if people, I 100% agree, disposable gloves should be tossed out. If people are using their personal gloves, you know, like winter gloves, wash them before you use them again. I mean, the thing to do is, is assume that the outside of the glove is contaminated, because it probably is. Um, a, a disposable kind of glove, you're not going to feasibly be able to wash to, to, to get that clean. Um, if you don't have that uh, possibility, you can wear a winter glove, some other glove, as long as you keep laundering it to clean it up afterwards. And don't throw the disposable gloves on the ground, please. We don't want to be picking them up off the ground. Uh, the mask, all of, uh, we, we, uh, sanitation is picking up people's gloves and masks. Let's dispose of them and don't throw them in the toilet either. Uh, they should go in a, a, a waste a basket receptacle so we can dispose of it properly, uh, you know. Uh, here's a question that says, I know that there are people recovering. I think you guys answered this a little bit, but uh, what makes them able to recover as opposed to someone else? I guess that's a question asking uh, how could they fight this thing? Why are people dying and other people not? I, I think one of the first th things to realize is, is getting COVID is not a death sentence. <clears throat> Most people, 80% of people, it's a mild disease. They don't even know they have it um, or they, or they um, uh, get it and it feels like a cold or a flu. They, they don't know any, any different. Uh, but there are people who get very sick from it. Um, and there are people who end up in the ICU, intensive care, ventilators. And it's a great question about um, how are people who recover different from people who don't recover. Um, we only know a little bit, this is a new virus. What we know is young people are less likely to have trouble than older people. We know that people with underlying conditions are more likely to have trouble. Um, those underlying conditions include uh, chronic lung disease, uh, asthma, diabetes, hypertension, other such conditions are more likely to have problems recovering um, th than people who are not. Um, people who come from from uh, disadvantaged communities also seem to be having more problems. Whether or not that's because they're also suffering from, from more of these other chronic diseases or whether it's something independent, we don't, we don't know yet. But you know, it's clear that there are populations that are at higher risk. Um, all that, give, you know, given um, the Newark population, goes back to my emphasizing the mayor's points of listen to his advice, um, socially isolate. Um, but but um, 
I think it's important to recognize it's not a death sentence, but uh, if you do get it, um, but the people who suffer from it and suffer from it most are the people with underlying conditions and older people. Anybody okay. else could jump in if you'd like? Yep. Yeah, I'd like to jump in on that. Uh, absolutely, Dr. Strong. But uh, in addition, uh, something that we all need to realize is that, again, though individuals who are older, 60 and older, uh, or do have one of these underlying conditions, uh, results in a, in, a, in a decreased immune system, which makes it more likely that you, that you would have a, a negative outcome, or more likely even to die. But infection rates are not determined by age. In other words, when we look at the statistics for, for newer, uh, only a third of those who are infected are 60 or over. That's right. The largest group who are infected in their, uh, are in their 30s, 40s, and 50s. And we have infection, a uh, significant infection in, our, in 20s and in teens. So this, this idea that unfortunately our community has grabbed that while well, I'm young, I'm strong, I'm good, that's not the case. The case you are just as likely to become infected. And even if you don't become as ill, you become a major transmitter of the illness. So you don't want to be 17 hanging out and say, well, you know, I'm strong. I don't need a mask, you know, everything is good, I feel great, but you go home and you live with your grandmother who's 73 and has diabetes and, and, and is on the dialysis machine, you know, you could be signing her death certificate. That's not what we want to ha have happen. We want you to follow all the recommendations and assume that you're just as vulnerable as anybody of any age. And I was that, 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 uh, doctor. Yeah, yeah, and people should, we've, we've had plenty of hospitalized people in their 20s and 30s. Uh, you're not immune just because you're young. You may be less likely to die from it, but, but as Dr. Wade said, you're not immune because you're young and, and pe you need to protect yourself and you need to protect everybody around you who, who may have other conditions or may be older, uh, like the example of the, your grandmother that Dr. Wade gave. In, in fact, based on our data in Newark, you, you're not just as likely, you're more likely to contract the virus than anyone else because you're outside and you're doing things that you have no business doing. I just learned of a, a, a house party. Like and I say this every night when I do this, people are, because they're not going out to these big clubs, they have these parties, social gatherings in their home with a few people in their family and they go over there and they, they get sick. And, uh, or or they, they, they're having these uh, private beauty parlor or barbershop kind of events that are, that are uh, allowing people to uh, catch the virus and then go spread it uh, somewhere else. So you have to be very, very careful, very, very careful, especially that age group, because we believe we're invincible and that we could tough it out. And because we don't feel any symptoms that we're in fact not sick. And that's just not true. Um, I, I have the, uh, uh, another question. Um, it is, are, are any new testing sites being created? Are any new testing sites being created? And uh, how, how do I get tested? Um, Mayor, if I could just, I, I have some information from the county that they asked me to share. Is this a good time to do that? Jump right in. Okay, great. So in response to the pandemic, the Essex County Executive established a drive through COVID-19 testing site located in the Essex County Weequake Park in the city of Newark. The site is run by the Essex County Health Officer. Her name is Maya Lordo. The doctors and nurses conducting the testing at that site are from our own community facilities, including the Newark Public Schools, University Hospital and Robert Wood Johnson Barnabas. It opened March 26th and remains open Monday, <clears throat> excuse me, Wednesday and Friday each week until further notice. So um, that's right, that's happening. I know the FQHC, so I just want to, people to just jump in about testing. That's what people are, that's what the question is, is hinting at. How do I get tested? Are there any other testing sites? Would there be any more set up? Obviously the one at Weekway Park has been a great asset to us in the city of Newark. We want to thank the county executive for, for, for partnering and making that happen but they can't test everybody so we we people are asking about that I think it's also important to note that uh, even with the new sites that that, that are being opened uh, you still have to meet the CDC guidelines for being tested so you, you just can't and correct me Carrie, if I'm wrong you just exactly. can't say, okay I want to get a test so I'm going to go to Weekway Park, get in line, and I'm going to get tested. Unless you meet the criteria, 
coming into contact with somebody who has already been diagnosed uh, with COVID-19 or your, your physical symptoms, okay, as assessed by a healthcare professional says, yes, you should be tested. You can't just walk up or drive up and get a test. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, so to make an appointment, th this is an appointment only site, as you know, and you need to go to EssexCOVID.org and the folks that are being tested there are symptomatic individuals only, just as Dr. Wade said. But I also just wanted to, to let you know as well, um, Mayor, that um, so far the data coming out of there that over 1,400 Essex County residents have been tested there. And out of those, 849 are Newark residents. So that's about two thirds. I just wanted to give you that information. That's excellent. Um, also, any, any, that. any, go ahead. Go ahead, Dr. Wade. Uh, for, for, uh, at our FQHC, the Mary Elijah Mahoney FQHC um, uh, at Williams and University Avenue, um, we do have a testing capability, but again, it's for those who meet criteria. And that is, a, that is a major site for our residents without addresses and others who don't have a physician uh, or, or don't have a healthcare profession, professional uh, to even assess them to make a determination about whether testing uh, is available. Uh, so if anybody meets that criteria, you don't have a doctor, you're not sure what to do, uh, I want to give you a number that you can call that will access um, QHC uh, and will avail you an opportunity to talk with a, a clinician by phone because we want to first give you the right information and then give you an appointment if deemed necessary to come in uh, overwhelm the city, uh, the, I'm sorry, our center. And, and that number is 800 Seven three four seven zero eight three eight hundred seven three four seven zero eight three. And again, to clarify, this is not I just want to test. That's not why you're calling this number. Is I'm not feeling well. I don't have a doctor to connect with, so I need somebody. This is the number you call, and and that's our business is to take care of you. So. Those are the only two places in Newark that people can get tested now. No, actually, some of the other uh, have testing capability. So you, if you just uh, go to your directory and look up federally qualified health centers and give them a call, um, those are other places that may be able to provide a test, again, if you meet the CDC uh, requirements, okay, not feeling well or having been in contact with someone who is COVID positive. And I, th I think people should realize early in the epidemic, there weren't enough tests. Then, as more tests became available, there weren't supplies to take the tests, swabs or, or viral media. Those things are more are closer to being solved now. And so these testing facilities are, are great. And, and people, if, if they meet the qualification, we can't, we still don't have enough tests to test anybody who wants. With the, the kind of things that Dr. Wade was talking about are critically important. If you meet the criteria, you, people can now get tests. That's an excellent point. Can I share one last thing, Mayor? Yeah. Yeah. I know everybody wants to get a test, but let's just walk through it. If, if you're, you're not feeling well and you call and you don't meet the criteria, we're going to tell you to stay at home, isolate yourself, do what you would have done last year if you felt like you had cold or flu-like symptoms. If we say come in and we're going to test you, we'll test you. And if you're not sick enough to go to the hospital, then we're going to say go home, do what you would have done last year until you get your test results. If we, you do that and we call you and give you your test results and it's positive, we're going to say continue to stay home, do what you would have done last year, and then meeting the CDC guidelines, which is the maximum of seven days, if your symptoms are gone and you have no fever, you're out and about. My point is this, getting a test is not a cure. Getting a test is to help us in the medical profession to do better uh, a disease investigation to find out who you're in contact with so we can better put our arms around minimizing the spread. It does help to guide treatment if you become very, very ill, but unless you end up being hospitalized, our recommendations are gonna be the same. The, the, and, and it helps people psychologically and emotionally too, Dr. Wade. Yes, it does. <laughs> but, 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 but you also have to be careful. I mean, Dr. Wade's comments are very important. Yeah. The fact that you're negative today doesn't mean you're going to be negative tomorrow. 
Right. Okay? And, and if you go and get a test and you're negative, that doesn't mean to go hang out at a bar. Right. If you're invulnerable or you're okay. That's a good point. That's a good point. The, 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 the other side of it is what you said, the, how fast we can get the results back, you know, because some people, you know, they just don't have the discipline to hang out and shelter in place. If they feel good, they're going to go wander outside and uh, think that, that it's okay to go here and go there. Uh, and, and, and that's not what that means because you feel good doesn't mean you don't have the virus. Um, so there's a couple of questions. Uh, I guess this is for me. If I'm having trouble claiming my unemployment, is there another option? Uh, unfortunately, there is no other option for unemployment. You should go to www.myunemployment.newjersey.gov and uh, uh, try to interface with that. Uh, I know there's a number that people have been calling, 201 601 4100 you have to just keep calling, keep calling. There are a plethora of people that are trying to call. I would say continue uh, to, to call as much as you can. Um, this is a question about my work has been negatively impacted because of coronavirus. Can the CARES Act, the new uh, federal law, help me? Yes. I would go to the Department of Labor website. As a matter of fact, after this is done, the city of Newark is going to put up some FAQs, frequently asked questions uh, regarding how do you interface with the uh, CARES Act around unemployment, um, around the stimulus money or, or check that you should probably get in the mail, around uh, me medical leave, all of those things you need to interface with. Uh, we'll put up F F FAQ on our Facebook webpage and on the city of Newark's webpage uh, so you can deal with those questions. But I would go to the Department of Labor's website uh, as well. Um, so should my child be wearing a mask? Absolutely. Absolutely. Your child is a human being and ju at just as much risk as anyone else. So please make sure that they have a mask on. And, and, and they might even enjoy it. <laughs> make, make, make a game out of it. Um, but, but again, just to emphasize the comments from before, it's not only, it's not primarily to protect them. It's because they may be carrying the virus and they could give it to you or your, uh, their aunt or their uncle or their grandmother or, or otherwise, it's to protect the community. Uh, two more questions. One, if, which is very important, if I'm stuck in a house, who can I turn to if someone is abusive or I just need help coping uh, from isolation in general? Doc, I know we have some numbers. Yes, we do. Yeah. Well, for, firstly, uh, if you're concerned about uh, abuse of any type, uh, I want to give you the number to our Shani Baraka Center. Uh, and that number is 973-733-7538. 973-733-7538. Also, if, if you're having any challenges and you, you just think you're losing it, you might need a, a mental health professional just in Newark, and I, Dr. Strong might be able to add more just uh, in terms of the various uh, mental health services from Rutgers. But if you call our FQHC number, we can then connect you with a mental health provider if that's something you need. And again, that number is 800-734-7083. 800-734-7083. Is that the same number for testing too, Dr. Wade? Yes. Okay. Uh, Dr. Strong, you want to join in? Yeah, I, uh, I unfortunately don't have a number with me, but certainly if you call the state hotline um, yes. that, that we, we man out, out of Newark, as I mentioned before, they'll be able to get you help. They'll be able to connect you to, to people with help. Uh, the question that I have and, and that I've been getting is when do we expect to be able to go outside again? When, when is this all going to be over? It's questions I've been getting all day. I told people I'm not a doctor. I can't answer that. <laughs> um, you want you want to go first? The truth is nobody knows. I mean, that's the truth. Uh, we take it day by day. We take it week by week. What we want to see is that the the rate of infection, not the not the rate of deaths, the rate of infection starts to decline. We still are on an upward slope, so we want to see the rate of infection to flatten out and then decline. Uh, and that gives us, puts us in a better space 
but we also have to be extremely careful because we know even with that decline, when you know in in a matter of weeks or a month, things look much better. There is the opportunity for this infection to rebound because we still might have so many people that had, didn't ever get tested, which is what we're basing our decisions on. Now are out there amongst everybody else, and the infection rate can can rebound and go back up. So. Unfortunately, we all have to be very, very patient. All of us are having cabin fever, but it will, it, this will pass. And the longer we're able to bear with it now, we'll minimize the chance that it rebounds later. Anybody else could jump in if you'd like. Yeah, it's a, but a um, little bit different perspective, not disagreeing in the slightest with, 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 with what's been said. I think we need to think of this as a two-year process. It's gonna be that long before a vaccine is available and widely used. And the uh, when it's out there, the, we want the people of Newark to get vaccinated as soon as possible and as many as possible. That doesn't mean you're gonna be locked in your house for two years. Um, the goal of the social distancing uh, uh, right now is to avoid the spread of disease so that the amount of disease can drop. We're approaching peak, it's slowing down. So the hope is, if in the next few days or a week we hit peak, it'll then slowly, slowly decrease. And then as, as it slowly decreases, at some point, things will slowly be released because it'll ultimately be a balance. If we release too fast, we'll be ba right back where we are now and everybody's gonna be right back in our, in our houses now. So there are things that are higher risk, like, like schooling, like group, big group activities, that may be the last things to, to come uh, get restored. But there are other things like go out in the house, go out of the house, be able to be with some friends and so on that might be possible in a month or two. Um, but it remains to be seen as Dr. Fauci says on TV all the time, the timeline here is gonna be dictated by the virus um, and by the, wh what the virus wants. And it's gonna differ in different parts of the country. The, the, the unfortunate thing is Newark was one of the earlier areas to be hit. The good news, it, it will therefore be one of the earlier areas to recover, and hopefully it'll, it'll be able to be released a little bit sooner than others. But, but this isn't a tomorrow thing or a next week thing. We, we need to think about this. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. This will all end, all end, when, once there's a vaccine that's widely used in a couple of years. Um, between now and then, it's gonna be a careful tightrope of staying in the house, um, letting people out, um, and as you let people out, there'll be some infections. Don't get scared when there are some, but, but the idea is we, d we don't want to be back where we are now uh, with huge numbers of infections and, and, and people dying. Uh, there's a great article that I think people should read that I, we just uh, talked to the directors about today uh, in the city of Newark, which is an article in National Geographic that talks about the response to the 1918 Spanish flu and cities that uh, practice social distancing. People thought the word social, word social distancing was new. Obviously it's an old term. Um, uh, and it talked about how people, the difference between the death rate of cities that took too long to shelter in place versus the cities that did shelter in place and the cities that, that, that jumped out early and tried to uh, come outside again, uh, how they began to reinfect their population uh, again, that you said two years because it was interesting because in that article, it, they actually had to deal with this for two years, uh, uh, this, this whole sheltering piece. Uh, so it's important that we uh, take uh, history seriously and take a note from what's happening and what has happened in the past. Uh, what we're doing is not a mistake. In fact, I, I just don't think we're doing enough of it in enough places. And, and, and the point that you're making about it plateauing and none of that stuff begins to work unless we stay in the house. So there's no way we could make any determinations about anything unless people begin to follow the instructions of, of what's being given throughout the state. Um, yeah, the national models that are saying the number of deaths may be nationwide smaller than originally expected assume everybody stays in their house through August. Right. Um, and and, and it's, that's important to realize. And as people begin to emerge, the, the cases will increase, the deaths will increase. You know, the good news we have compared to the, the 1918 Spanish flu that the mayor was referring to is we, we will have vaccines that they didn't have there and uh, that, that will end it, hopefully. And 
hopefully between now and then we'll have treatments um, uh, to be able to use for those those who are sickest. But uh, uh, right now, in many ways, it is exactly analogous to the mayor's example from from of the Spanish flu. And the major the the major effective intervention now is to follow the mayor's advice and social distance and stay indoors. Well, I appreciate everybody for uh, participating in this. Our residents definitely appreciate it. We get a couple of thousand people who watch this, so this, this message will get out to many, many, many residents. Uh, we appreciate you. Uh, the, I'm sorry I didn't do the shout outs today to many folks that are out there working. And I just wanna uh, say thank you to the police and fire department that are consistently uh, passing out uh, food and, and masks now to our community. Uh, we want to thank all the workers at MPS who are working tirelessly to make sure our kids eat, all the teachers and staff members there uh, who are making sure education continues uh, uh, in the city, shout you out, uh, all of the healthcare professionals, nurses and doctors that are risking their life every day uh, to take care of, of our relatives uh, in, in our community in this place. Just want to note we can't get through any of this without uh, us working collectively and uh, uh, folks all in all of our health uh, officers throughout the state of New Jersey and their teams that are working to track this virus down and try to contain it in some form or fashion. We appreciate all, all of your work uh, as well. I usually end with a poem, so I am. Uh, this one is about hope. It says, hope knows no fear. Hope dares to blossom even inside the abysmal abyss. Hope secretly feeds and strengthens promise. God bless everybody. God speed to you. We're going to finish this. We're going to get through it, uh, but we only we can only do it together. Thank you for participating, everybody.